Hi, I'm Naomi Hall, and I have with me today Dr. Lisa Lucas. She has 30, over 30 years of experience in education in multiple forms. She's been a teacher, she's been an instructional coach, an administrator, a consultant, and now she's a professor at Westchester University of Pennsylvania. Um, Lisa researches and develops practical self-care stress reduction strategies for educators, exactly what we're looking for here. And she is the author of Practicing Presence, which explores strategies for educators to develop the quality of presence within themselves to enhance their teaching and their students' learning. Her vision really is to provide professional development to educators all over the world, challenging mental models and inspiring educators to be present for themselves and their students. And she has a second book that will be published soon called Paths to Presence, which has 180 practices for teachers and connections for students. So welcome, Lisa. Hi, Noe. I mean, thank you for having me. I'm sorry, I flubbed your name right there in the beginning. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about your first book, Practicing Presence. How did that come to be? That book originated through my experiences of being in countless schools. When I was a, an administrator, I was in a large suburban public school system and I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed. And I recognized that most of the teachers that I saw on a daily basis were also overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And and I thought it was just our district. I really did. I thought, well, and it was a wonderful district, but I thought it just must be us. Mm -hmm. And then when I left the school district, I did not intend to become a professor full time. Um, I was caring for two um, elderly parents, both who were end stage of different diseases. And I thought, I'll take a year off. I'll take a year off. And I and I had my doctorate and I thought, I'll go to Westchester University and I'll, you know, do this for a year is gives me a little bit more flexibility. By the way, that was in 2008 and I haven't left yet. <laughs> okay. So that is, that really turned out to be a place where I, I really found I get such joy from the students, mm -hmm. but you asked me how it came about. So I had student teachers and I was supervising them and I was in school districts all over the state of Pennsylvania. And I quickly realized it wasn't me. It wasn't my district. It was everywhere. And teachers all over said the same thing that they just couldn't keep up. They weren't finding enough joy. They felt that there were too many initiatives. And so teachers themselves expressed over and over that, uh, that feeling of not being able to keep up, but so did administrators. Mm -hmm. So it felt like it was a culture of just too much. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that, when I went to the university, this is for anybody out there who kind of jumps into it without really thinking it through as I did, they asked me what my research agenda would be. Mm -hmm. And initially I said coaching because I had written a dissertation on coaching. I had been an instructional coach. I'm still a coach, but I quickly pivoted and decided to research why the stress and what we could do about it for educators. Mm -hmm. And I started doing lots of workshops, tons of workshops, love to do workshops outside of my role with the university. Mm -hmm. And everyone always said, do you this in one place. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I would give handouts and things and people kept asking. So I put it together and I wrote it in that first book. And, and that first book was anecdotal in that I shared some of my own experiences, mm -hmm. a lot of research based on, you know, what, what were the real foundational causes of the, you know, the root causes of stress and then practically what could we do about it mm -hmm. so that's where that all came about it was never you know I, I'm always envious of people that have such a clear trajectory like I'll do this <laughs> and I'll do this and I'll do this and I've kind of just listened to what I would just kind of call my internal wise self and it has taken me into just where I think I'm needed and so I think at that time it was needed and I and I feel like it was a real service to so many people so that's that's where the first book came about Mm -hmm. I can relate to that. Like I have not had a straight path either. Like, yeah, it's, and it's definitely not a path I expected to be on, you know? Um, yeah, you get into education, you kind of think it's a pretty straight path and, uh, 
then things happen. <laughs> right. And, and I kept, you know, and I, and I kept hitting what people would say would be like the peak. Like in other words, I was a lead teacher. I love teaching. Then I was the first instructional coach in our district. I loved that role. And then I found myself in administration, like second in command. And, you know, it, all of the things that you think matter, like I had a bathroom in my office, like anybody that's a teacher knows, like that's what you crave is like, you know, I had administrative assistant and I realized none of that matters. Right. And so every step of the way, what I found is it's really important to stay, take stock, take stock of how it feels. Do you feel purposeful? Are you able to give without it taking too much from you? And if not, you know, think again. That's a great question to ask yourself. Can you give without it taking too much of yourself? Right. I don't because think I any- tend to. Yeah. And that's because I know myself, I tend to go all in. Mm-hmm. And then that could be detrimental to your own, you know, your own ability to balance everything. It's when you give and give and give and you want to, and that's educators. Mm -hmm. You know, you just want to, it's it's something, there's something, there's an instrument that I designed called fuels and drains. And -hmm. that's one of the things I'm just about to do it again, because I'm starting a course and I'm going to have the students do it. But you really take stock of what's draining me. What are the things in all the different areas that are just too much? And then you eliminate some, and then you start adding some fuels. Mm. That, that sounds profound. I would love to do that exercise. I think that's a, that's a great one. I'll send you that. I have that and I'd be happy because I think, you know, so anybody that listens to this, that could be a tool that could be a takeaway. Fantastic. I would love to share that with them. Um, so you wrote that one book, but what led to the second one? <laughs> Never in a million years did I think I'd write another book. Um, well, what really led to it is I think what I realized is, again, the title is Practicing Presence. Mm -hmm. And it's such a shame that we have to practice something that's so natural, right? Being present. Mm -hmm. But I realized without personally, and I found for so many educators, without little reminders of what matters most and kind of a grounding for your day, you just kind of get lost in the daily blur. You just start, you start your day you next thing you know, it's over and you collapse into bed. And so what I realized was I needed to, you know, and it was during, you know, this is so cliche now, but it was during the pandemic where I was like, started to write every day, a new practice to keep myself really aligned with what matters most. And then as I dabbled with it, I realized, you know, where I hadn't taken the first book, I hadn't taken it to students. And I did that intentionally. I wanted to send a message to educators that you have to start with yourself. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, wouldn't it be really interesting if I had practices for educators, like it's like a daily book, like a two minute read, Mm -hmm. something to just remind you to start your day with presence. And then if they went into the classroom and had a quick what I'm calling a connection to do with their students, it would reinforce that. So it would not only begin their day, but it would permeate the day so that they were making those connections with students. Mm -hmm. I also, and I'm a grandmother, so maybe this is what it is, but I'm realizing that so many of our students aren't connecting with each other. I see it at the university. I see it in the schools that I'm in. And so we're losing that personal. There's we're, We're more connected than ever before. And yet somehow we're losing that connection. Mm -hmm. So all the practices and connections for students are really mostly technology free. They're old school. So you could just read it and do it anywhere, anytime. That's fantastic. I think we need, we need so much more disconnected time away from the technology. I think there should be a balance. I think a balance of anything makes sense. And and so in, in looking what was out there, I think this provided, I think we have an overabundance of really good technology, you know, sites and different things they can do, but I haven't seen as many resources that aren't technology based. And it's funny, you said that that title, I think I, I landed late this week, it's called Paths to Presence. Well, stay tuned, because I keep changing the title. <laughs> so I'll have to keep you updated. But it, it's interesting, a title is a really tricky thing. I don't know if you're aware of that. But um, I just want something that is crystal clear when people hear it. 
Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that the second book you take to the students. So what are some of the other key differences between your two books? So the first book was more of a traditional book that a teacher would read that was just in a format that had, as I said, it was anecdotal. And then it had, it had eight chapters and each chapter I took the word presence and I expanded on different strategies, lots of research and application. This book is meant to be more like a day book. It's something that any teacher could pick up and they could read the very first part like based on the theme in less than two minutes, maybe a minute. I've timed myself reading it. So it's, if you've ever seen a day book format, it's very, very short. And so there, there's a quote and then there's a topic and then there's the practice for the teacher and then there's the connection for the student. So implementing the practices and connections would take more than two minutes, but just getting your mindset and just reading it would just be very, very, like I said, a minute to two minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's a format that I think is missing out there. I also know teachers and teachers are busy. My daughter's a first grade teacher. I mean, I've given her so many different books and I see them sitting there collecting dust. Mm -hmm. She says, I don't have time. And I think a lot of our newer teachers are used to reading digitally or reaching, reading something that's very short and succinct. So I wanted to provide something that was in an accessible format. Well, that's fantastic. It's almost like, to me, I think of like a quick daily devotional type of Thing. That it's got that feel. It really does have that feel. And it's interesting you said that because in the beginning, I was doing this for just adults and children because every time I would be out and about, I would see so many adults with children and the children, young children were on devices. Mm -hmm. They'd be in a restaurant or they'd be in the <clears throat> grocery store or they'd be in different places. And I thought, oh my goodness, people were missing that connection. Mm -hmm. Um and then I and then I realized my people are educators. So I brought it home to being teachers and students. Yeah. So is this something that they could almost like pick any day that they want to do, kind of pick and choose throughout the 180 that you put in there? Absolutely. So, you know, table of contents, you look through and you think about well, what what really resonates with me right now. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be done sequentially. No shame. In other words, you don't do day one and then day two. And oh my goodness, it's I forgot it's accessible for when you want to do it. Mm -hmm. I know as a classroom teacher, when I taught, I always had like a morning meeting format mm -hmm. and I followed many, uh, like a, a, a structure where we would have a sharing and a discussion and an activity. And sometimes I wasn't sure what to do. I remember thinking, what am I going to do today? Mm -hmm. And so this really is SEL in morning meeting format with the, with the connections for students. So it's just all social emotional learning and, and the ideas are right there. So again, busy teacher, walk in, trying to think of how you're going to start your day, how you're going to bring that group, how you're going to form a community, get everybody really um, discussing meaningful things or doing an activity that's meaningful. Like I was just, I was editing it just now. And one of my excerpts is cherish the ordinary. And so, so often it's because I've been looking through old pictures and things. And I realize in old videos, you take pictures of like holidays and special occasions and vacations. But what I'm looking at is the teacup that my mom held. And what I'm looking closely at is the wallpaper. And so like the cherish the ordinary is about, you know, the activity for the, for the adult would be like, just maybe take a few pictures of your ordinary day. Mm -hmm. And then for the students, maybe a homework assignment, like what's ordinary, take a picture of your room. Um, and so they're all very, very simple things. Now that one, I was trying to make a point that you could have it be an extension. You could have things that went out of the classroom or not. So there's just a lot of choice. I think teachers like choice. Yeah. I love that, finding the ordinary, because I've been really trying to find the beauty in every day, and that it, like, it's there, we just have to look for it, and, you know, it's the, it's the lilacs that are, I live in New Hampshire, so it's the lilacs that are blooming right now, it's the, it's looking at them, it's smelling them, it's um, the honeysuckle that just smells amazing, it's, it's those little things, and just taking a few moments to see them. So you just mentioned the five senses. And so that's a big one. Like in other words, if we would each begin our day with just tuning into the color around us, mm -hmm. the beautiful color, and every time of year, there's going to be a different color and noticing that or the different sensory, you know, you mentioned the lilacs. I mean, 
but so often we're just, you know, we're, we've got to be somewhere. We've got to, especially, I always think of, I was a working parent in the mornings, like me trying to get my children where they needed to be before I went to work and all of that, you know, it, it's just, it's just a gentle reminder to slow down a bit. Just mm-hmm. notice. I think we all know what to do. It's remembering. Yeah. Yep. As you were talking about peaks in your career, I could really relate to that of like, I've hit different ones and then been like, what now? So now that your career has kind of shifted a little bit um, and you're you're at the university, you know, tell us about a peak experience for you professionally. It's interesting. My peak experiences have always a common feeling. You know how you go through your days and you just do things and you're never sure if you've really made a difference. Mm -hmm. You just do it and you hope that something you say or something that you do lands. And it doesn't just have to be with teaching. It could be with a conversation that you have, you know, getting your coffee with, 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 you know, whoever's, it's just, you always wonder, did I make a difference? Mm -hmm. And every peak experience I've had has been when I've done mostly a presentation and someone comes up afterwards and shares how much it meant. Mm. And and I think that's the teacher in me. I think I was, um, most of my career was in elementary school, although as a supervisor, I supervised all levels. I think I've, I really do think I've had every job almost there is in education, (laughs) but, but as a, as an elementary teacher, you got pretty much immediate feedback. You know, you would see their progress and you would know. Well, in different phases of your career, you do so much and you're not sure, did it really hit home with somebody? And so I, you, the peak experience, I was doing Title I, I was doing a Title I conference and it was, I won't go into the whole story, but afterwards I got done and all of these teachers came up to me and they just hugged me and they're like, thank you. And every time someone expresses that something I've done has in any way impacted them, it's just, it's a game changer. Yep. I love that. Yeah. That means so much when you hear from the people. And I know we shouldn't need that. I mean, one of the things I often say to myself is I want to be independent of the good or bad opinion of others. So I don't mean the accolades. I don't mean, oh, you're wonderful. I don't mean that at all. I mean, someone expressing that whatever was done impacted them and will help them move forward. Mm -hmm. I think there's such a difference and and that's, yeah. Yeah. Seeing people move forward in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you do a lot of things like you're working at the the university, you have your own LLC, you're a coach um, doing workshops, keynotes. Tell us a little bit about all of that and how you manage to maintain a balance. <clears throat> well, I would be not being honest if I didn't tell you it's been a struggle because what happens is, as I said in the beginning, I go all out and then I could end up working and just working and just working. Okay. And what I've realized is I like change and I like doing a variety of things. Mm-hmm. And so for me, my work at the university extremely rewarding. I love teaching. I love, I teach graduate and undergraduate. And I've been there long enough now that that isn't, I'm no longer like I used to be the graduate coordinator. Oh, here's Elsa. (laughs) This is Elsa. She just thought she'd say hello. Welcome. (laughs) Um, But I realized very quickly that I like I like to do a variety of things. And so the coaching was just a natural kind of stepping stone initially from the instructional coaching. Um, when I left the school district, I went to a three-year three year coaching program at the International Coaching Society. And so I got, and so I love to coach, but I only take two clients a semester. Okay. So I thought, okay, if I'm going to give my all, I'm going to just do this much. And so in everything I do, I sit down and I put in very thoughtfully how much time I have to do something and and how I'm going to allocate that time. Another tool I have, 
to decide, well, I'll send you both. It's um, it's really taking stock of saying yes or no to one more thing. Mm. And so it's a list of questions like, should I do this? Yes or no. And there's a whole bunch. And, and the last question you could just skip to that is if I say yes to this, what won't I be doing? Mm-hmm. Make sense. Yeah. And so you were asking me how I do it all. And, and, and I do it in a way that I have just enough that is inspiring. It keeps me fresh. It keeps me like researching and reading and being innovative without overdoing it. Mm-hmm. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. You do have to, like, if you're going to take on something new, you have to have something else has to go. Yep. There's only, I, I have, I do something called a Sunday meeting self-care plan that's in the book. And I sit down on Sunday with my digital and my paper calendar and I put in everything I'm going to do that I have to do that week. Mm-hmm. And then I look at the spaces and then I put in something and I always make a code word for something that I want to do for myself. Mm -hmm. And I make it like it's an appointment Mm -hmm. (laughs) with somebody. Like I always call it, I always call it appointment with Sophie. And that might mean on a good day, I might go for a bike ride. I might go for a hike. I might just take a walk. I might read a book, but I put that in and I keep that on my calendar. Otherwise that balance doesn't happen. I think if I weren't intentional about trying to create balance and leisure time as much as work time, I don't think I'd have it. Mm, That's, that's fantastic. And that I'm realizing that that's what I've unconsciously done for myself because I'm a martial artist. And so that's booked in my calendar, Mm. my training sessions, like, and and my family knows like those are sacred times, (laughs) you know, what type of martial art? Um, I do Shaolin Kempo. So karate. Oh, that's so, you know, that I, that's one area I've always thought that that would be a lifetime practice. How long have you been doing that? Um, About five years now, five and a half. That's, that's, that's impressive. Yeah. Yep. I love it. I, I've done a few other styles as well and I do a little um, jujitsu with it, but it's, it's my stress reliever or mm-hmm. one of them. Um, mm-hmm. I, I had about a month break between schools because my school closed and I was like, oh my goodness, I need to find a new one. <laughs> I was like, I need to get back into this. Like, this is one of my important tools to keep me balanced. Well, and something like that is mental as well as physical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I think you just made a really, you know, key point is that all of us have different. That's why I wanted to have so many practices. Mm-hmm. Everybody finds something that resonates with them. And so I would never think that something I would write would resonate with everyone. Mm -hmm. But if there were a lot of choices, I think what people do is they try on a practice and if it resonates with them, then they seek more of it. Mm -hmm. But if you never bumped into that possibility, then you might not. So that was the other intention behind, you know, the second book of giving a lot of choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the process of getting the second book published? Because I know that a lot of people watching, obviously this is to educators, but I know that there's a book brewing in a lot of people right now. Um, And I think they have, they're kind of like, but where do I start? What's the starting point? Where do I go? Do you, how do you do this? So could you give us a little on that? Sure. I think one of, one of the things that I've always done, did you ever read Julia Cameron's morning pages? No. Um, she she was a writer and she always talked about every day to start by just writing, just writing free, free writing. Mm-hmm. And so I took that concept and what I did was and have done for a long time is I would get up and I'll, I have a practice of mindfulness or meditation, whatever you would call it. And I and I would take some time to do that. And then I would go exercise and then I would look through, um, you know, all the different resources that we have to get ideas and then every day I just made sure for at least 20 minutes I just wrote Mm -hmm. I just wrote and maybe it doesn't have a definitive table of contents and a definitive like this is where I'm going but if you have a practice of that's dedicated and every day you do that now seven days out of seven no, I'm talking more like five out of seven. Mm-hmm. What will happen is 
what you want to most communicate will emerge. It will come out of those pages. And so rather than, you know, we all have ideas sometimes left to kind of percolate and just to kind of do lots of sloppy rough drafts and, you know, it will come together. Um, I, I think, I think there's so many people that have so much to offer. And I think it's just the, it's being, it's persevering. It's just saying, okay, if this is important to me, then I need to in some way make sure I prioritize it. Otherwise those thoughts just swirl around in your head. And what I've noticed is I feel like ideas happen and they're given to you. And if you listen, you get an idea. And if you don't take action, that idea goes somewhere else and somebody else takes it, right? Mm -hmm. Not takes it, but you know, moves on it because that's how it's supposed to happen, right? You're supposed to have a lot of um, creative ideas emerging. So if you have, if you have that feeling and you're a potential writer, just start writing. It doesn't have to have a, um, a clear beginning and end. I love that. So if you're a writer, you're going to write, right. Sit down and you're going to find time to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's fantastic. That's it. Yeah, you make you make that blocked out time, and you'll get something eventually. <laughs> and you know, you, you know, it, it, you have to treat writing as you can't. If you wait to write till you're inspired, <laughs> mm-hmm. nothing's gonna happen. So, so, it, but once you just start, however you write, if it's on the computer, if it's freehand, whatever you do, once you start writing, it comes. Mm-hmm. It's just taking action. It's it's like in coaching. I always say to my clients. Just take action and let the and, and and it all emerge. Yep. Well, then I just have a couple quick questions to end this. Um, I love to end interviews this way because it just helps me. It expands my horizons. Um, what are you currently reading, watching, and listening to? Oh, okay. Let me do reading, watching, listening to. Okay, I'm watching Ted Lasso. And here's me. I didn't realize that everybody liked Ted Lasso and it was a hit. And so I stumbled on it and I never and I was like, I can't believe I like this show. <laughs> Little did I know it's everybody's watching it. So I've been watching Ted Lasso. Um, listening to my current podcast. I've been doing a lot. But let me just think, what did I listen to today? Gabor Mate is someone who has done a lot with trauma. And I think it really resonates with educators. So mm-hmm. he's uh, been doing a whole lot of podcasts. So I've been listening to a lot of him because I'm about to teach a trauma-informed education course. So he's someone I think is wicked smart and very practical. So I've been listening to just about anything he does. Um, I listened to the happiness lab with, um, oh, what is her name? Lori Santos. Okay. Um, and reading, oh my goodness. I have, I have like 20 books going at once, but let me (laughs) just think, what did I just finish? Oh my goodness. A beautiful. So someone said to me, I have a, um, I take a walk up the hill and I stumbled on this beautiful place and it's called St. Mary's of Providence. And in it, I found an old broken down little structure, really, really small. And I, and you go inside and it's just, it's just beautiful. And I was telling someone that they said, it sounds like a thin space. And I said, what's a thin space? And they said, you don't know what a thin space is? I said, no. They said, look it up. So I came home and I looked up thin spaces and I fell in a book called Thin Spaces that no one recommended. I just found it. And it's a, it's a writer that comes from Ireland and it was all about the beauty of different places. And so a thin space is a a place where you feel connected to something other than yourself, that you feel resonance, that you feel peace. And so that book, and I can't remember the author without going to get my iPad, which I probably could, but that book, it was an, it was an unknown. In other words, it's not on the bestseller list. No one told me about it. I loved that book. Wow. I'm going to have to look for that. Yeah, it was beautiful. That sounds wonderful. I, and I'm the same. I'm like reading a bunch of books <laughs> at the same time. I like have a personal development book going that I read in the morning. I have a fun book at night. I have, yeah. you know, a business book going. So yeah, I have a lot of different books going at the same time. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us and telling us about your journey and your books and uh, thank our audience for joining us and please check out her book, 
Lisa Lucas when it's published. And Lisa, will you let me know when it releases? I will let our audience know about your book. I sure will. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. So thank you. And thank you so much for reaching out, for giving me this opportunity and for having such a really nice conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was fun talking with you and learning about your books. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Take care.